Well, we're in the second part of Genesis chapter 10, and uh, we stopped uh, where we did last time because I wanted to get more into detail about uh, this guy named Nimrod that we meet in, uh, in chapter 10. Um, you know, this is a guy that you really need to understand um, because it's from him that the first uh, religion and cults are born. And we're going to get into a lot more detail in regards to that in the next chapter, chapter 11. Um, but for now, uh, Genesis chapter 10, starting in verse 8, it says that Cush begot Nimrod. So Cush was his father. And it says that uh, Nimrod began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, Kalni, in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, uh, Rehoboth, Ur, Kala, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kela. That is the principal city. So his name, Nimrod, means valiant, or it means to uh, rebel. And, you know, when you do a study of this guy and the Antichrist, <clears throat> who will come later, there's all kinds of uh, similarities. And let me just give you a, a couple. First of all, they both begin a, a one-world government. Um, and they're both not really anti-Christ, but more Christ imitators. They're counterfeits. They're phonies. That's why when you read about the Antichrist in the Bible, you see that so many people, even so-called believers, are completely deceived by him. Because he doesn't come off so much as an Antichrist, but again, a Christ imitator, a phony, a counterfeit. Uh, but both of these guys, Nimrod and the Antichrist, they both began a one-world religion. Um, they're both very powerful, very political, very manipulative, um, charismatic, actually, politicians, if, you know, when it comes down to it. That's how we would see them in our day. And um, we're going to see this a lot with Nimrod in chapter 11 when we get there. Um, and then, of course, with Antichrist, not only in the book of Revelation, but many books of the Bible speak about the uh, coming Antichrist. Um, throughout, you know, ancient history, um, Nimrod was uh, worshipped, you know, even after he died, you know, worshipped as a hero. A lot of folklore, a lot of fairy tales were told about the guy. And the story basically goes like this. It, it says that Nimrod had a wife. Her name was Semiramis. Um, she was titled the Queen of Heaven. Um, they had a son together. His name was Tammuz. Um, he was conceived, of course, of a, a virgin birth. That, that should uh, ring familiar. It, it's all, you know, fairy tale, of course, but that's the story. Um, you know, in, in, the, in this is not, you know, you don't have to just take my word for this. You can go to your Bible. Um, the book of Jeremiah speaks about him. Ezekiel writes about him. Um, you know, when Israel was at the height of, uh, of idolatry, um, they worshipped the Queen of Heaven. And if you go to Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 18, and again in Jeremiah chapter 44, verses 17 through 25, you'll find that there. Um, and of course, they worshipped uh, Tammuz in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 14. It tells us there that God took uh, Ezekiel to the temple. Um, God cut a hole in the wall and he says, you know, Ezekiel, look in there and look what my people are doing. And then, of course, you see all of these things that the, that the actual, the, the religious leaders were doing. And they were worshiping uh, in many different ways. Tammuz and his mother, Semiramis. It all began in uh, chapter 10 and chapter 11 of Genesis, which is why it's so important to understand What's going on there? 
or what's going on here. Um, so, you know, this worship of Tammuz, the Queen of Heaven, it's evolved over time, over thousands of years. And so you might have seen people that don't know very much about their Bible. They wear a cross, and the cross, rather than be a T, it looks more like an uppercase T with a loop at the top. Um, that has nothing to do with Jesus. That is all about Tammuz, who in the days of Egypt, when Egypt ruled the world, and maybe in some parts of the day in the world today, um, that uh, T with a loop at the top uh, symbolizes, the T is for Tammuz, I should say, and the loop is for the sun. Because in the days of ancient Egypt, uh, Tammuz wa had evolved into what is known as the, the sun god. And when you see the name of Pharaoh, the R-A-H in the middle stands for Ra. And Ra was the sun god. That's why um, the Pharaoh was always uh, deified or, or, or worshipped as a god in the days of Egypt. So that's what that stands for. You go further, you say, well, you know, for Christmas, they put out a Christmas tree. Stand out of the box for a minute. Ask yourself these questions. What does a, a, a tree, an evergreen tree, or a pine tree have to do with, with the birth of Jesus? Well, nothing. Um, in fact, uh, the Christmas tree was uh, symbolic of pagan worship long before Jesus was born in the New Testament. If you go to Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, um, God uh, spoke of this indictment on his people because they were going out to the forest. They were cutting down these evergreen trees, bringing them into the living room, decorating them with silver strands. All of that goes back to uh, Tammuz. The Yule log that was burned uh, in the fire. Um, so that log in the evening would go into the fireplace. Um, it would symbolize uh, uh, Tammuz and it would burn. And, of course, be destroyed, turned into ashes. But in the morning, early in the morning, before the family woke up, the father would put a new log in the fireplace. And it symbolized the resurrection of Tammuz. Um, and the reason they did this is because one of the uh, fairy tales, the folklore, the story that was told about Nimrod and his son Tammuz and all of that, eventually... Nimrod becomes Tammuz, Tammuz comes Nimrod, they become one person. You know, it, it gets crazy when it comes to religious tradition and nobody ever asks any questions. But the story says that, uh, you know, Nimrod, Tammuz, they were mighty hunters. And one day they went out to hunt wild boar. That's a pig, that's pork, which is why we eat pork. Or a pork leg, a roast, a ham, as we call it, on Easter and on Christmas. This is what it's tied into. Uh, they were out hunting, or he was out hunting. And he was killed by the wild boar. But three days later, he was resurrected miraculously from the dead. And so remember, this is a story that was told many, many years before the birth of Jesus. And, of course, this story, the roots of the story and the folklore and all of that has its roots in Satan and hell. Because Satan understood exactly what God said in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when he spoke of the coming Messiah who would be born of a virgin, who uh, would die and be resurrected again. You know, all of that. And, uh, of course, Easter, same thing. It all has its roots in ba ancient Babylonian religion. And if you really think about it, if you really want to go crazy with this, one day do a study on all the Catholic religious system, all of its symbols, and you will find that it is really just a carryover from the ancient Babylonian religion. Pretty interesting stuff. If you want to study further, there is a book called um, The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. And he covers all of that very thoroughly, all the way down to the pre-celibacy, to the black that they dress in with the white collar, the hats that the cardinals wear. I mean, the whole thing. Very interesting when you compare Roman Catholicism with the ancient Babylonian uh, religion. So, again, we'll be talking a little bit more about that when we get to Genesis chapter 11. 
But it says that Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Well, it says that because when you look at the original language, uh, Nimrod, because of all the false religion and cults that he brought into the world, or actually that Satan brought into the world through Nimrod, he was actually, what this actually means is that he was more of a hunter of men's souls, not wild animals, as people might think, but the hunter of men's souls because he used religion and he used deceit to actually turn people away from the truth of God to um, what we would call now, you know, something that's more politically correct. Well, verse 10 says, The beginning of Nimrod's kingdom was Babel, Erech, uh, Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. From that land, it says, he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, Reboth, Ur, Kela, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kela. That is the principal city. So, Nimrod, uh, you know, by the world standards, was a great man. I mean, he built great cities, uh, starting with Babylon. And, and, you know, where that's concerned, so Babel eventually turns into Babylon. We'll see that in Genesis chapter 11. But, you know, somebody said that um, the Bible can actually be titled the story or the, the tale of two cities. And uh, one city being Jerusalem, the city of God, of course. And the other city, the city of Babylon, which is the city of Satan, always has been and will be till the end of the days. Um, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, I've been to Jerusalem and I've seen some things. I've been there myself. And I'll tell you right now, Jerusalem is not now or ever has been uh, the perfect city, but it is the city that God chose. Babylon, very different on the other hand. Um, again, in chapter 11, we're going to see, but Babylon is the beginning of every false religion and cult, like I said before, that the world has ever, ever, ever known. When we get there, it's going to shock you just how many things, it's not just the church, it's other things that have taken on this whole Babylonian uh, structure. Um, but the Bible, the, the New King James Version, mentions Babylon 260 times in the Old Testament, 14 times in the New Testament. And, of course, in a geographical sense, it's in the Middle East. Uh, Genesis chapter 10, verse 10, says it's in the land of Shinar. And so if Babylon and all of these other cities that Nimrod built, if they are, uh, how should I say it? If Babylon was the city, it's in the county of Shinar. Very important to know as you continue to study the Bible. Uh, so that's the geographical area. But um, in a political or in a spiritual sense, Revelation 17 says that this Babylon thing is also a government system. It's a government system that is married to a religious system. That's the way it's described in Revelation chapter 17. And uh, of course, again, it, belong, it, be, it begins with Nimrod and uh, Babylon in the land of Shinar. And what it does is it sets a pattern. So this model that uh, that Babylon is or becomes a governmental, uh, religious system, financial system as well. Um, it actually takes over the world when, well, probably in our day. I think that's what we see when our liberal government wants to join or partner with this one world government. That's why Christians who know their Bible, they freak out when they begin to see that happening because it's just more evidence that we're living in the last days and that our world government system is turning into what is described in Revelation chapter 17, our monetary system uh, as well. And so I told you that it begins, this Babylonian system begins in Genesis 10, um, but in the last of the last days, it ends. And it's interesting God informs us, God wants us to know that it's going to end in the very same place that it began. And if you read uh, Zechariah chapter 5, verses 5 through 11, uh, it is this Babylonian system is referred to as a her or a harlot or a whore. Um, again, because it's political, but it has married with uh, religion. And it says in Zechariah 5 that um, she is returned 
to her original place, which is again in the land of Shinar. And finally, in Revelation chapter 18, verse 2, God destroys her, and then we will never, ever see her and her system uh, of government, of uh, religion, of whoredom, of you know, political, all of that. She's gone forever, and it is celebrated. So when we see that, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 18, we are going to not only be astonished and amazed, but we're going to celebrate. You know what's interesting about this whole Babylonian thing is in the book of Revelation, John sees her. And whatever she is, she is a whore. She is riding on the beast. She has a cup of blood in her hand, and that blood is the blood of the saints. And when John sees her, he recognizes her. And a lot of people believe that the reason John recognizes her is because she is the church. And more and more and more, as the church begins to move away from the Bible, more and more, it takes on all of these features that resemble ancient Babylon and that system that God warns us about. It's such an interesting subject when you when you study it thoroughly. And again, chapter eleven, we're gonna we're gonna get there, but. It says, of course, that Nimrod uh, built other cities uh, as well, and that's a great thing. You know, unfortunately, all or uh, most um, have been, and even to this day, uh, the enemies of God's people. And so let's just recognize some of these cities that he built. Uh, uh, it says in verse 13, uh, Mizraim begot Ludim, Ananiam. I'm not going to pronounce all these names. Verse 14 gives you the other names of cities. Well, Mizraim is Egypt today. And if you know what uh, Bible prophecy has to say about the last days, <clears throat> about all these cities that are going to very soon come down to uh, attack Israel, God's people. Egypt is one of them. Uh, Ludim and uh, Anamim and Lehabim. Um, those cities have not been discovered yet. Nobody knows where those cities were, but they were somewhere in that same area, probably in the north of Egypt. Um, archaeology has a lot to do with some of the things that we're talking about here right now. Um, there's another city. It's, it's difficult to pronounce. It's uh, Pathrusim. And this is the area of northern Egypt. And so there, you know, one, uh, one uh, group of uh, Nimrod's family and the cities that he built were, of course, southern Egypt and northern Egypt and those areas. Um, Kasluhim and Kaftorim, those cities turn out to be the ancient Philistines. And this is confirmed. This is not uh, archaeology or otherwise, although archaeology has confirmed it. The Bible in Amos chapter 9, verse 7, refers to that fact. Uh, Jeremiah 47, verse 4, also will tell you that those cities became uh, the land of the Philistines, which, of course, always have been the uh, enemies of Israel. That's where Goliath came from. Um, Delilah, that's the harlot that uh, Samson messed around with. And if you ever hear people talk about the land of Israel today, sometimes, especially uh, Muslims, uh, Arabs, they'll refer to it as Palestine. And you might wonder, hey, that's Israel. Why are they call it? Why are they calling it Palestine? Well, what happened about 2,000 years ago, 1,900 years ago, actually, is um, Rome was in power, and Rome was completely fed up with Israel. You have to understand that when you are dealing, when you want to create a world government, and you are confronted with God's people who are just bent on holding to the truth of the Bible, you're going to have a major interruption. And um, Rome was just fed up with Israel not going along with the program because Israel stood on the truth of the Bible. Um, I forget the emperor's name, but he passed an edict or a law that said, that's it, we're done. No more Jews are ever allowed in Israel. And they call it the uh, di diaspora. All the Jews were cast out and um, Rome went in there and tore down a bunch of trees um, covered the whole area with sand.
and um, it became a wasteland. And in the final act, the, the, the last slap in the face that Rome gave to the Jewish people was renaming it. Rather than Israel, Rome renamed it Palestine. Why Palestine? Because Palestine means Philistine. And the Philistines were known as the ancient enemies of Israel. And so um, the renaming of Israel, the, when they renamed Israel Palestine, it was just a slap or a spit in the face of uh, God's people. And so um, it is the promised land. It is named um, Israel after the name that God gave uh, Jacob. We'll get there when we get further ahead in the other chapters of the book of Genesis. And so that's the history, a little bit of history of, uh, of the land of Israel. Well, in verses 15 to 20, is the genealogy of Canaan. And if you remember, that was Ham's youngest son, uh, who Noah cursed in Genesis chapter 9, verse 25. And it says, <clears throat> Canaan begot Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, the Jebusite, the Amorite, the Girgashite, the Hivite, the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Ardvite, and all of these other names. And it says, afterward, the families of the Canaanites were dispersed and the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as you go toward Gerar, as far as Gaza. Then, as you go towards Sodom, Gomorrah, Adama, Zeboim, and as far as Laisha, these were the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, and in their nations. Well, this is pretty straightforward. Um, all these people become the cities and the towns in the land of Canaan, which is Israel, uh, which is that's what Israel was called before it was Israel. So it was Canaan, then it was Israel, and then it was Palestine. But all of these people that we just mentioned, all of them were in the promised land when Abraham got there in Genesis 12, verse 5. And then later, of course, and, uh, you know, as you continue to read, uh, all of the Canaanites were wiped out, and the land of Canaan becomes Israel. So when were all the Canaanites wiped out? Well, when, or I should say after, the Israelites were freed from the bondage they were suffering in Egypt. And here is where, again, people who don't know their Bible, um, they want to blame God, hold God somehow guilty, uh, because he commanded that his people, when they left Egypt, go into that promised land, again, called Canaan at the time, and they were to wipe out, literally wipe out all of these people. And it's true. And history and archaeology and the Bible, you know, God's not trying to hide that in any way. So you got to ask yourself, if our God is a God of mercy, a God of pa uh, compassion, uh, uh, long-suffering and patient, why would God command his people to go in there and wipe out all of these Canaanites, all of these sons and daughters of Canaan? Well, I'll tell you why. And again, when you study your Bible, you pick up all of these details. Um, the Canaanites were probably one of the most immoral people in all of history. I mean, so much so that if they were allowed to live, they would have morally... Uh, theologically totally polluted God's people when they arrived into the promised land. And so God said, listen, when you see these people, you're not even to touch their belongings. After you wipe them out, everything needs to be burned. Well, the reason for that was, you know, when a society becomes as immoral as these people were, uh, sex becomes so twisted, so dark, actually unimaginable. And then we know from our culture, all of these diseases become present. And in those days, they didn't have the technology or the medicines that we do. So if you can imagine people walking around with sores all over their bodies, with fevers, with all kinds of illness. When you read the Bible, these people were even having sex with animals. They would worship animals, have sex with animals. 
They would leave dead bodies laying around as another form of worship. I mean, it was just unbelievably sick, which is the end result of sin that um, is out of control. And again, when we see things like we're seeing in New York and California, that's why Christians who know their Bible begin to freak out. Because we know what happens in a society that practices such things. When you can't go to church, but you can go to a strip club, um, when you can buy recreational marijuana legally on the streets, but you can't sing in church, listen, there's a lot more going on than just the coronavirus epidemic. It's a spiritual battle. Um, you know, another thing that I, I wanted to mention is that in these days, that uh, we're living in, we see the progression of the immorality. And we see that that progression is in direct proportion to the exodus of the church people. That is, people who don't go to church anymore, or if they do, the pastors are not teaching the Bible. Listen, when you take away the Bible, from a society, you take away the measuring rod of truth and morality. When you take away the measuring rod, anything goes because nobody can tell whether something is moral or immoral. It's all left to people's opinions. That's why you see a lot of these people, politicians, that want to sound uh, in some way or some form religious, they talk about holding on to their faith, being loyal to their faith. They never talk about being loyal to the Bible. That would be a no-no because people like, well, I'm just going to mention them. Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Nancy Pelosi, uh, Gavin Newsom. All of these people are in favor, just give you one example, of abortion. But they say that they're Catholic. Well, how could that be? Well, because they're talking about religion, not the Bible. It's very important not to get the two confused, especially when it comes to Roman Catholicism. We talked about why in the beginning of this session, it just resembles uh, Babylon. And let me tell you, that whole Babylonian system had no problem with killing babies. They could do that all day long and still call themselves religious was what we see with you know a lot of Catholic people today. And there is a division in Roman Catholicism because part of the Rome people who call themselves by the Roman Catholic faith, have become very liberal. Same is happening with the Methodists, who are marrying homosexuals. And uh, many, many uh, so-called Christian denominations who are really not Christian at all, if, and that's an if, Christianity still holds to the Bible, then I'm afraid a lot of people who call themselves Christians are not Christians. If Christianity and some faith that they talk about has nothing to do with the Bible, then go ahead on. I guess you're a Christian, and we could even start calling rocks Christians because it means nothing anymore. So that's the history of uh, the Canaanites. They were cursed since the day uh, Noah cursed them. Uh, they fell into idolatry really, really bad. And they suffered the penalties uh, for that. You say, well, I thought God was patient and long-suffering. He is. He waited 400 years, the Bible says. While Egypt held God's people in bondage for 400 years, God was allowing time for the Canaanites to repent, and they never would. And so that's history, uh, true history, not folklore. Uh, verses 21 to 31, of course, is the <coughs> genealogy <coughs> or the line of Shem. And this is where we want to focus because um, the Bible is going to follow this genealogy all the way through. Why? Because this is the line or the genealogy that eventually gives us the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And um, again, just like the city of Jerusalem, the genealogy of Shem, we are not dealing with perfect people, but they are chosen people. And if you're a Christian, uh, a Bible-focused, Bible-centered, Bible-informed Christian, then uh, the Bible says that uh, as a Christian, we are grafted into this same family. Uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 17 um, tells us that we're grafted, you know, we're actually adopted into this Jewish family. In Romans eleven seventeen, 17, uh, the Bible compares it to an olive branch. So you get an olive branch from one 
tree and then you graft it into uh, another olive tree and it grows together. That's what a Christian is to the Jewish uh, community. Uh, in verse 21, it says, And children were also born to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber. If you have your Bible and a pen, underline that. The brother of Japheth, the elder. And again, notice it says that Shem is the brother of Japheth, but doesn't mention that he's the brother of Ham. Kind of strange. But those are the three sons of, of Noah, Shem, Japheth, and Ham. Uh, verse 22, the sons of Shem were Elam, Asher, Arphaxed, Lud, and Arab. The sons of Aram were Uz, Hul, Gether, and Mash. Arphaxed begot Selah, and Selah begot Eber. It's repeating it because that's important to know. We'll see that in a minute. To Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. And his brother's name is Joktan. Joktan begot Almat. I'm not going to go through all of these names. But uh, verse 28 mentions a guy named Jobab. And it says that all these were the sons of Joktan. And their dwelling place was from Mesha, as you go towards Sephar, the mountains of the east. These were the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, according to their nations. Well, in verse 29, it uh, is believed that this guy Jobab is actually Job. Uh, so if you're familiar with the, the book of Job and his story, it's believed that Jobab was actually uh, Job. Uh, from Eber... I had asked you to underline that in verse 24. We get the word Hebrew. Hebrew. And the word Hebrew means to cross over to a region beyond. That's what the name means. And it's very fitting because when we get to Genesis chapter 14, verse 13, that's exactly what Abraham does. So Abraham is not Jewish. He is a Mesopotamian man from the land of Mesopotamia. And the description we have of Mesopotamia is it was surrounded by two rivers. Well, when um, God called Abraham to go to the promised land, he had to cross one of those rivers. And from that point on, he is called a Hebrew, which again means to cross over to a region beyond. Or it also means a river crosser. And so... Um, from this point all the way to Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3, the genealogy of Shem is followed again because his genealogy leads to the birth of Christ. And you're going to find a lot of these names that we just went through in this chapter again in Matthew chapter 1 and in Luke chapter 3. Verse 32, it says, These were the families of the sons of Noah according to their generations and their nations, and from these nations were divided on the earth after the flood. So, to my knowledge, um, there is no other document in the history of the world that has more details about how the earth was repopulated after the flood than this chapter right here, Genesis chapter 10. And so we're going to end it there. Um, stay tuned for Genesis chapter 11. We're going to talk about the Tower of Babel and the beginning of cults and false religions. We're probably going to be there two or three parts. And I guarantee that is going to be one of the most interesting chapters in the entire Bible. Certainly the chapter that when you understand it is going to lead you to understand so much about the rest of the Bible, particularly um, prophecy. Um, and where things are actually going in our day. You're going to see that so much more clearly. So with that, everybody, thank you for joining us again. Uh, may God bless you. <clears throat> may he keep you and your loved ones healthy. Continue to pray, especially for us in California and in New York. It has gotten, our government is boldly standing in the face of the Bible and Christian people who believe their Bible. And just really, um, it's not even a secret anymore. They're, they're really wanting to uh, shut us down. Um, in California, there are at least two pastors that are facing uh, fines. They've had to go to court recently because um, they are not shutting down their churches. And the congregations are meeting in the church on Sundays. Um, our church is doing the same. And uh, my wife and I, my family, has made it a point to show up, as many people have. 
and uh, we are doing what we are calling a uh, peaceful protest so black lives matter uh, uh, these other radical groups they're calling themselves peaceful protesters they're rioting they're looting they're burning uh, businesses um, and nobody is saying that they're not peaceful protesters at least the majority is not but when the church meets on Sundays we're not peaceful protesters we are violating the law and government is coming after us we think these are just signs of things to come so keep us in prayer father thank you for your word thank you for this uh, Genesis chapter 10 father and the account of uh, the post flood and the repopulation of the world where would we be without it Lord in this we know you love us you it is your heart's desire to share secret things with your people and here we are father exploring those secret things that you have desired to share with us and for that we're so grateful father not only to discover these things but to understand that because we have them it's just more evidence of your love for us we pray for this lost world we pray that you would protect your true church and father if you have uh, if it's been your will that we come to a place as the church to suffer in these days let it be father let us move forward with a boldness not a cowardness let us hold on to our bibles father i pray for every single pastor to give up all of the charismatic topical sermons and to take your church through the bible in these days father like never before it is so badly needed Father, thank you. Lead us in this day. Father, bless all of our listeners. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And of course, as usual, we're going to close this out with this wonderful song uh, by Jennifer Johnson, I Am Elijah.